Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Wellness Wednesdays webinar. The Parkinson's Foundation is a nonprofit focused on bettering the lives of those living with Parkinson's through improving care and advancing research. Importantly, everything we do is in close concert with our community to ensure that our actions are aligned with the needs and the priorities of those living with and impacted by Parkinson's. Making an accurate diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, particularly in its early stages, can be difficult. Today's webinar will review the newest criteria for diagnosing Parkinson's disease based on the current understanding of PD. We'll also look at emerging technology and advances in research that are helping doctors make a diagnosis or distinguish between Parkinson's and other similar conditions. Haiti Health at Home is presented by the Light of Day Foundation, whose gener generosity has made this programming possible. And we want to thank this webinar sponsor, GE Healthcare, for supporting our mission. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly education and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, Fitness Fridays, Expert Briefings, and our Spanish language programming, Epi Salud en Casa. Join us for next week's webinar on recognizing and responding to Parkinson's psychosis. Not everyone with Parkinson's will experience psychosis, but it can be frightening if you don't know what's happening or how to handle it. It's important to be able to recognize these symptoms if they occur. We'll learn what to watch for and know how to respond to these behavior changes to ensure the safety and well-being of you and your loved one. You can find out more and register for our PD Health at Home programs at parkinson.org slash pdhealth. To begin our formal presentation, I'd like to introduce today's expert presenter. Dr. Itshamul Haq joined the University of Miami as Chief of the Movement Disorders Division in September 2020. His academic journey began at Columbia University where he completed degrees in bioengineering and philosophy, Following by, followed by obtaining his medical degree at SUNY Downstate and Neurology Residency at Georgetown University. He completed his Movement Disorders Fellowship at the University of Florida's Norman Fixell Institute for Neurological Diseases before being recruited to Wake Forest School of Medicine where he spent a decade and became an associate professor in neurology and neurosurgery. Dr. Hawk's research focuses on understanding and improving care for patients with movement disorders with an emphasis on technology and brain circuitry. Funded by NIH, Parkinson's Foundation, and industry partners, his work includes research on Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and rare diseases like ATP1A3, rapid onset, dystonia syndrome. Since joining UM, he has overseen rapid growth in the Movement Disorders Division, expanded clinical trials, and established significant partnerships. He has been a pioneer in deep brain stimulation surgeries, treating a range of conditions, and is committed to including historically underrepresented patients in research. Dr. Hawk has published extensively and serves as Associate Director for the McKnight Brain Institute, focusing on cognitive aging. Dr. Hawk, thank you for sharing your valuable time and knowledge with us today. Krista, thank you so much for having me, and thank you to the Parkinson's Foundation for asking me to give this talk, because it's a topic I'm deeply interested in. So, let's see. Hopefully, uh, are you seeing my slides? Not I yet. My, I have to share my screen first, of yeah. How are we now? Looks great. Thanks, Dr. Hawk. Absolutely. So as I was saying, I'm delighted to be here to talk about this particular topic. So let me get right to it. First disclosures, uh, I have consulted for compensation from a number of companies. Uh, here they are. I'm funded by a couple of different institutions. Uh, my current industry funding, Bio, Blue Rock, and Surrogate. Uh, and also I should note, I'm indirectly benefited by all the trials um, that the division itself runs, as well as our uh, donors. And I did want to mention that I did use some AI for some editing, artwork, and for search. All right, on to it. So today we're going to try to do a couple of things. One, to understand how a diagnosis is made using uh, our standard criteria in the physician's office. Learn about what screening tests are available that use technology and other processes to aid in diagnosis. And I will warn you, this cannot be complete because this is an exploding field right now. And uh, it's impossible to discuss all the different ways in which we try to diagnose PD now. 
I would love to have some questions about anything you don't hear about that you'd like to hear about. And lastly, I'm going to talk about some research on exactly these things, on methods to assist in our diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, uh, and perhaps other Parkinsonisms as well. All right, so I think we have to get a little philosophical first to really be able to discuss this appropriately. So the first thing to talk about is what Parkinson's disease is, uh, and even what a disease is at all. Because I, I would argue, although we say Parkinson's disease, we don't really mean that it's a disease. It's more of a syndrome. A disease is going to be a collection of symptoms that can be traced to a particular cause. We think we have a pretty good idea of the potential causes for Parkinson's disease, but in practice, we look at what people have. It's a clinical diagnosis. We say you have a certain set of features, and if you have that features and you match that pattern appropriately, we say you have Parkinson's disease. And that matters uh, for reasons that I will get into throughout the next 40 minutes or so. Specifically, syndromes have symptomatic treatments. So for example, if you say someone has uh, tuberculosis, that's a disease that has a known cause, a particular bacteria that causes it. But it used to be called back in the 1800s, something called consumption. All they knew was that people tragically started coughing up blood and looking unwell. And so they couldn't treat the disease. They couldn't treat the bacterium. All they could do would, was to try to treat the symptoms themselves. The point being diseases have cures. Uh, and I gave one example, consumption versus tuberculosis, uh, edema versus something called dropsy. Um, and in our desire to move to cures for Parkinson's disease, uh, this question of diagnosis and moving to an actual disease entity becomes pretty crucial. So Parkinson's disease. First, I'll talk about what we do now to recognize the uh, clinical syndrome. So Parkinson's disease, like I said, is a collection of particular features. The motor features we look for are the rest tremor, when present, bradykinesia, rigidity, and balance problem. Those of you who have Parkinson's disease or have loved ones with Parkinson's disease will already recognize that this is not a perfect definition, even of the clinical syndrome. Plenty of people with Parkinson's disease do not have a rest tremor at all. Uh, and the other can, symptoms will be present to varying degrees in different people. But still, you have to have a definition to try to nail down whether a person has a thing or doesn't. So this is what we currently use. We look to see whether a person has a rest tremor. In other words, whether the tremor happens when they're not using the hand, and it usually is the hand. The hand, since it's so important to everything we do, is one of the most represented areas in the brain. And so if you're going to affect anything in the brain at all, hand function is often one of the first things to be uh, affected. Typically more on one side, Parkinson's is not something that's coming from all over your brain at once. Uh, and so it tends to start either on your right side or your left side. And again, it has to be a rest tremor, i.e. it improves with movement. So this is not the kind of tremor where as you're trying to bring a fork to your mouth, it shakes a lot. That can be there in PD, but that's sort of an accessory to the main event, which is your hand shaking when it's just sitting there waiting for you to do anything with it at all. Like I said, you don't have to have rest tremor to have Parkinson's disease, but it's one of the cardinal features. Everyone has to have what we call bradykinesia. Bradykinesia is our medical term for slowness of movement. That's all it means. The movements are slow and small. That shows up in a lot of different ways. A lot of people are diagnosed, they say, just as they walk into the office. And this is one reason. Uh, that sort of decreased facial expressivity that comes from the facial muscles not being quite as mobile as they were formerly. Decreased dexterity, too. So people often notice that it's a little bit harder to, say, pick a bill out of a wallet, uh, to do buttons, to use utensils. Handwriting is kind of the classic one where that shows up, where handwriting shrinks down and becomes a bit smaller. Uh, but in short, bradykinesia, as far as dexterity goes, just means not being able to move your hands or limbs or legs quite as much as you would like. And really, I've had a lot of really young, uh, younger PD folks who were diagnosed uh, based on things like uh, a stiff shoulder. Uh, it was just didn't go away, and eventually the tremor popped up, and it showed what the shoulder had been from all along. Decreased arm swing as a person walks on one side is another sort of classic symptom that uh, often gets you diagnosed right as you walk into the doctor's office. Rigidity is something we look for, but patients may not notice to the same degree. Um, that's just a matter of your muscles resisting movement. So, you know, this is baked into the bradykinesia to a certain degree, but we still count it as a separate feature. And to patients, you don't necessarily feel stiff. If it's severe enough, you will. Uh, but this may just be interpreted as weakness or soreness. Like I mentioned, you know, a lot of people come in with a sore shoulder that later turns out to be part of their Parkinson's disease. And patients will find, people with Parkinson's will find 
that when they attempt to lift something, they usually can lift more or less the same weight as before, uh, but it's slower, one, and not for as many repetitions. And so, like I said, that gets interpreted understandably as weakness. But lastly, balance problems are a pretty classic feature, and that's from a couple of reasons. Uh, one, people tend to start leaning forwards to bring their center of gravity more over their feet. Their bradykinesia often means for many patients that their feet aren't moving as far with each step. And so in order to better preserve the balance, there's some lean. There's also potentially what's called festination or retropulsion. That means taking lots of little steps forward without being able to stop or lots of little steps backwards without being able to stop. Again, like other things I mentioned with Parkinson's disease, not something everyone experiences, but uh, it is not at all uncommon and more importantly, it is characteristic. So those are the motor features uh, on the, which basis we diagnose Parkinson's disease. And like I said, currently the clinical diagnosis is not much more sophisticated than this. Uh, we look to see if a person looks like they have Parkinson's disease. There are a couple of different criteria that uh, are checklists of these syndromes included in the potential diagnosis is whether or not it's happened over time, as you'd expect for Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's thankfully, typically starts slowly and moves relatively slowly for most people. Uh, and also whether it responds to the kinds of things that Parkinson's is supposed to respond to specifically. Another way of looking at what Parkinson's disease is, as described in a clinical entity, the clinical entity, this description of a person's symptoms is trying to get at this idea what the underlying chemistry is. This is another piece of the puzzle that goes into this overall picture that we call Parkinson's disease. It's mostly, but not entirely, uh, a decrease in dopamine production and storage. So you see here two slices through the back part of someone's brain, through the midbrain specifically. And you can see how the arrows indicate that you've got this dark area here, which is where the dopamine neurons are, an area called the substantia nigra. And here in the brain of a patient with Parkinson's disease, not as much at all of uh, visible dopamine production going on. Uh, and so one of the things that Parkinson's is supposed to do is to be from a decrease in dopamine and to respond to, to dopamine. So dopaminergic neurons are dopamine banks also. They release dopamine, as I said, but they also store it. And that's important to understand in the clinical course. They release what you need and they store the extra. So I've given you two pieces of the puzzle so far, and I'll give you a third in a moment, but I'm defining what the current diagnostic methodology is without inflicting the detailed criteria on you. The logic is you have a certain set of things the person looks, shows you that they're doing. It should be from a certain chemistry, i.e. from dopamine. So if you give dopamine back, at least some of the symptoms should get better. And over time, you see this kind of changing response curve. What's this? This is an attempt to show that changing response curve over time. Parkinson's is also progressive. So as time goes on, there are more symptoms. As time goes on, that means the medication has to do more work. So initially, early in the course of disease is supposed to be sort of how a person progresses from early disease through later on. In early disease, when things are relatively mild, it's pretty easy to keep dopamine levels where they need to be. And whether they're high or low, whether you're in the process of building them up from your last dose or breaking them down, doesn't much matter. You have enough dopamine to do what you need. And as time goes on and you're making less and you're storing less, uh, unfortunately, the medication needs to be more frequent. And it's harder to stay in that window where you have enough dopamine in you. Sometimes it might be a little bit too little. Excuse me, sometimes it might be a little bit too little. And sometimes it might be a little bit too much. As time goes on, that effect becomes uh, more apparent. That is also something we look for to try to make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, whether the dopaminergic response is changing over time and that there is a dopaminergic response at all. But this is sort of another way of showing the same thing. This is what patients with Parkinson's typically experience. Uh, many of you will know about dyskinesias. For those of you who don't, dyskinesias are a feature of what can happen when you have more medication in your system then your system knows what to do with it at the moment. So if you think of dopamine as unlocking your movement, dyskinesias are when it unlocks your movement too much. And so you get these extra wiggling, they're often described as wiggling or writhing movements. Basically people look restless and sometimes really restless. So early on in Parkinson's, again, it's really easy to have enough dopamine in you so that you have enough to respond, but not so much that you're hitting dyskinesia. But as time goes on, as I said, that window gets shorter and shorter. 
So that's our current diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease, but it's not great. Uh, it misses people who do have Parkinson's disease. Um, it includes people as having quote unquote Parkinson's disease who later on on autopsy proved not to have that kind of chemical change or pathology. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about three different sort of categories of diagnostic criteria gathered under three ways to think of Parkinson's disease. So first, you can think of it as a disease where protein accumulates gradually in your cells. I'll talk more about this in a second. You can think about it as a disease of genes. And you can think about it as a disease of inflammation. And all three of these overlap to some degree because you're talking about the same process through different lenses. And as I said, this is the lens by which I'll be talking about or new advances in diagnosis as each has its own assay, its own means of detection. So first, I'm going to talk about Parkinson's disease as a proteinopathy, as a disease in which protein accumulates. I think this is the one you might be most likely to have heard information about. And to talk about it a little bit, I have to talk again about what Parkinson's disease actually is. So what underlies the disease? I've talked about the clinical features, what it looks like. I've talked about the chemical feature, at least one of them, that there's a decrease in dopamine. And... Um, that's a good place to start from, I think. One of the things we think happens with the disease is you accumulate this protein, this long word that many, I think, of you have heard before, uh, this protein called alpha-synuclein. Alpha-synuclein is a protein that's present in the brain, and we're not really sure what it does, to be honest. It's there in people who don't have Parkinson's too, so it's serving a function, we're still in the process of figuring out exactly what. There are good theories, but we have actually a better understanding of what's going on when it isn't working correctly. alpha synuclein really builds up in two parts of your brain first. One, the olfactory bulb. And two, the medulla, which is a part of your brain stem, a posterior part of your brain that controls a lot. Uh, breathing, sleep, other similar things. Now, this actually explains some of the initial features of Parkinson's disease. Now I have said in the brain, because there's gut alpha synuclein first, and so constipation is probably one of the very first things people with PD experience. But once it gets into the brain, you've got uh, potentially a change in your sense of smell. Really, really common, not very specific in this era of COVID in particular, but it's often there, oh, excuse me. And also sleep issues. So something called REM behavioral disorder where People call out, cry out, act out their dreams in their sleep. Another useful thing to look for to make the diagnosis. That's the other thing that often starts first. The loss of sense of or decrease in sense of smell and the change in sleep habits can predate motor symptoms by decades. So again, not at all specific. Lots of people have REM or some type of sleep disorder from some other thing or, you know, difficulty with their sense of smell from any of a number of issues, COVID among them. But the two together are something actually that make us watch to see if something else develops over time. Gradually, alpha-synuclein involves adjacent areas and so spreads or seems to spread. And as it does, so the symptoms change also. So that's how it moves through the brain. This is how it moves through the cell itself. Here's a picture of this alpha-synuclein accumulation, what we call a Lewy body. And those of you who have heard of Lewy bodies, that's all a Lewy body is, this kind of circular mush of alpha-synuclein that happens to stain pink with the particular stains we usually use to look for it. It lives inside the neuron, and we think uh, impairs its function through a variety of different mechanisms. So one of the ways you would think you could diagnose this is to look for alpha-synuclein in your body. The thing is, I just told you, Alpha-synuclein is in the neurons by the time it's actually known to cause neuronal damage. So how can we possibly find it? Remember, I said it does spread from outside the brain first, it seems. And so we do have alpha-synuclein accumulations in the gut and also in the skin. So the Michael J. Fox Foundation, in collaboration with many other groups, looked for alpha-synuclein in skin. And lo and behold, found that it could be detected. This is one of the newest biomarkers that we have for Parkinson's disease, a biomarker being something we can look for, not just clinical appearance that will suggest the presence or severity of a disease. 
And here we are, assessment of heterogeneity among participants in the PPMI, which is to say, looking at how alpha-synuclein in skin varies among people in this large cohort study that was done called the Progressive Parkinson's Marker Initiative, the PPMI, which continues to give us really great data. So they did this thing called a seed amplification assay. And like I said, they're looking to detect abnormal alpha-synuclein because it's not just alpha-synuclein. You want to see that it's the abnormal kind that's starting to stick to other alpha-synuclein that's accumulating over time. So this seed is a little bit taken from the skin that represents the abnormal alpha-synuclein. And they call it a seed because it's like it grows. This is abnormal in a way that when it touches other proteins like itself, it joins onto them and makes them, like itself, a protein that will make further proteins join on. In other words, you can think of it like a snowball rolling down a hill. The seed gradually builds up more and more of itself until it becomes a, a toxic uh, accumulation, a toxic aggregate. And so seed amplification assay, so what's happening here is inside this uh, device that's measuring it, you're taking the seed and you're artificially seeing if it can be amplified. Uh, and it's only the abnormal protein that you should be able to amplify in that way. This is what the process kind of looks like. So you take uh, alpha-synuclein from uh, the person's skin, and you put them into lots of little wells. That well goes into a device that then uh, goes through a process of amplification through heating and exposing to additional protein. As those additional proteins stick, uh, those proteins bind to something that the device can detect, and you can see this increase in signal over time as the seed assay amplifies. So it's a really lovely way to quantify this. So to put that in words, you take the sample, in this case skin, but you do the same thing with cerebrospinal fluid. You put it with normal alpha-synuclein protein, and it's like a zombie protein that kind of gloms onto the normal alpha-synuclein and transforms it into abnormal alpha-synuclein, and then that whole process uh, continues. And so through that application, you can end up detecting the protein. This has already yielded some really, really interesting data. So the PPMI, like I said, is this large registry. So to give you some info, about 1,400 participants um, across the uh, planet. Uh, and a lot. The, not everyone has Parkinson's disease. So the study was done on people with Parkinson's, sure. But you also need people who don't have Parkinson's to compare them to. And what's also important, they also had people who later went on to develop Parkinson's disease, and also gene carriers also, so a good sample. And what's interesting is they found that this you could detect Parkinson's disease about 88% of the time, which actually, by the way, is pretty close to what we can do clinically too. Clinical um, correlation with Correlation always has to be with, with something. So if we say we're good at detecting Parkinson's clinically, it means it's compared to what? It's always compared to autopsy. Looking at a person's brain at death definitively says they had Parkinson's like changes going on in their brain. And then we say retros in retrospect, Parkinson's disease was the process that caused it. We're right about Parkinson's disease about 85% of the time. So 88% sensitivity is actually pretty good. Now, what's really interesting about this to me is we are starting to split people with Parkinson's apart. So we are not just talking about Parkinson's disease anymore. We're talking about Parkinson's diseases. They are different conditions once we can start to look. It's the same thing has, that has happened throughout history as our ability to see has gotten better. Microscopes, telescopes, personal computers, all these things allowed us to see many things we didn't even know we weren't seeing before. This is the beginning of that. So if you can't smell, well, the sensitivity is 99%. This tells us it's a kind of Parkinson's where your sense of smell is impaired and the kind potentially where it is not. So specifically, looking at people, and I'll talk more about this, with a specific genetic risk factor called LARC. Hey, their Parkinson's is different. For some reason, if you look at people at LARC, it's only detecting their condition 68% of the time. These are people with Parkinson's disease. Sense of smell seems to matter. So people who don't have a gene mutation, it's less than 88%, but not as low as with LARC. So we're seeing that there's some variation there too. But the really interesting thing to me is if you have LARC and your sense of smell is normal, this test misses you about 70% of the time, which is fascinating because that means that these people potentially have a slightly different process if it's resulting in a set of 
if it's keeping the synuclein from being as detectable in skin, which implies, again, that these diagnostic criteria are important because they will allow us to say different things about what you've got. So I can at least tell people with LARC, for example, which we test for, if their senses and after checking their sense of smell, which we check for, finding it's normal, that their Parkinson's is different and honestly, potentially slower. It's at least not as widespread throughout their system. That's why one of the, I think, examples why I think these new methods of diagnosis are so important. They're letting us show Parkinson's diseases in a way that uh, allows us to actually make differences for patients. All right. Because Parkinson's is a protonopathy, I said I would go through three things. Inflammation, uh, protonopathy, inflammation, genetics. So here's the second one, of course, Parkinson's disease as an inflammatory disease. So first, you know, what do we mean by inflammatory disorders? So inflammatory disorders are anything where your immune system is overactive. So that's a lot. Um, you have an inflammatory disorder, but a temporary one, anytime you have an infection, if you've got uh, a cold or the flu, you're in the midst of an inflammatory disorder that's going to pass. Typically, we don't call those inflammatory disorders. For inflammatory disorders, usually we're thinking of the more chronic issues. And so it's going to be things like Crohn's, rheumatoid, um, type 1 diabetes. People with autoimmune disease have a 33% increased risk of developing PD. So it does look like there's reason to think there's some kind of overlap. Uh, and if you look at genes, there are at least, there are multiple points at which genes that control inflammation also happen to be genes that make Parkinson's more likely. So again, pointing to their potentially being sort of this common mechanism. Two of the genetic mutations we're going to talk about, GBA and LARC, are two most common known genetic mutations, also affect, affect inflammation and immune function. And so these look like important things to be keeping track of. Uh, other things that suggest that inflammation is important, PET studies, which is a scan that looks at activity in your brain, has shown these particular kinds of cells, these inflammatory cells, wake up and start making too much product. They become active and overactive very early on in Parkinson's disease. Again, inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. And this actually might be where some of the non-motor symptoms of PD are coming from. I talked about the diagnostic motor criteria because that's where the diagnostic criteria have rested. I did also mention things like difficulty in sense of smell, sleep disturbances, but you know, and constipation. But there are a host of non-motor symptoms, depression, fatigue, especially that people with Parkinson's have to put up with. And maybe this is where that's coming from. A lot of having Parkinson's disease feels a little bit like having the flu. And maybe that's why this is. So further evidence, I'm not advising you go out and do this. There isn't evidence for it yet, but in animals at least, things like aspirin, meloxicam, actually seem to protect against some of the things that we do to make them look like they have Parkinson's disease. And at least in some of these studies of these uh, large cohorts, things like ibuprofen um, seem to result or at least be associated with a lower risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So some interesting suggestive stuff, but again, I am not suggesting you go out and start taking ibuprofen on the daily despite my next sentence. This also, by the way, potentially explains some difference in uh, male-female predominance, since women have at least two gigantic inflammatory, quasitory inflammatory events in their life, for many women at least, pregnancy for some, menopause for most, if not all. And so that also maybe gets at why there is that, uh, that difference. And I'll skip through this. This is essentially saying the same kinds of things, that we have these specific changes in uh, immune function over time. Okay, but we're talking about diagnosis, not why does PD happen, or not solely why PD happened, but like I said, the two are related. So there are things we can check, and these are things we're starting to check for Parkinson's disease. These are not perhaps going to be as much diagnostic unless they prove to be, you know, if you do a whole suite of these that somehow together they uh, provide a Parkinson's fingerprint, I think that's unlikely, but I think they could be helpful for monitoring how Parkinson's progresses. So one example is something called C-reactive protein, like you've probably read. It's a marker of inflammation, and it's higher in people with PD and maybe higher with more disease symptoms. Interleukin-6, it seems like you can't do a study on Parkinson's these days without including IL-6, another potent inflammatory response component. And here again, higher levels of IL-6 are seen in CSF and in blood, and so here again, this could be a biomarker, something we check to see how your disease or this aspect of your disease is doing, and also potentially 
how you are doing with respect to treatment response. It's really important for us to be able to say that this thing, this treatment, is slowing the disease down, if that's what it's doing. It's going to be very hard to detect that looking at clinical symptoms. I'm really glad to say, for most people with early PD, the first two years are not years of a lot of symptom change. That is phenomenal. I thank goodness for it. But it means it's really hard to do a study because a study looks, if you're looking at a trial or an intervention, the study looks at how much of a change there is. And if there isn't a huge change, even without the intervention, how are you going to know if the intervention made a difference? This is one way to look at whether the biomarkers that you think ought to change are changing. Just a couple of others. It's the same basic idea. Things like COX-2, cyclooxygenase 2, and uh, mitochondrial DNA release are also biomarkers of inflammation that could be relevant. And I mentioned mitochondrial DNA, A, because mitochondria are not known to everyone, so I should slow down and mention it because it's important and because it segues into the third point of diagnosis, the third diagnostic paradigm which is to say Parkinson's disease as a genetic disease. So here it is. Mitochondrial DNA damage is becoming a known marker of Parkinson's disease. Uh, this means I need to tell you what mitochondria are in case it isn't something you've uh, heard about a lot. Mitochondria, now this is the standard sentence for Cell Biology 101 or the powerhouse of the cell. These are little organelles, organ-like things, living inside every cell in your body that do most of the energy production. Now, going back a whole bunch of slides, I mentioned that one of the reasons we think Parkinson's happens is this accumulation of this alpha-synuclein in your cell. That means certain things in your cell start not to work as well, and the mitochondria may be one of them. So mitochondrial damage looks like one of the ways by which Parkinson's at least develops and is often the cause in a number of people. So again, mitochondria are little things in your cell, cell organelles that generate most of the chemical entry, the energy that your cell needs to, to do everything that it does. They have their own small chromosomes too. Uh, this is kind of a neat thing that um, you probably shouldn't spend too much time on because neat things end up sucking too much time out of uh, presentations with time limits. But it seems like mitochondria are the downstream evolution of some bacteria that hitched a ride in our cells billions of years ago and millions of years, millions a long time ago. Uh, and were so useful that they just kind of stayed around. Gradually, as time has gone on, cells and mitochondria have become so closely linked that the cell does some of the DNA work for the mitochondria, but they do have their own DNA also. This is important because that means their DNA is potentially inherited separately from your main DNA. Genetics is more complicated than it looks. Actually, it looks pretty complicated. Genetics is really complicated. But here's one simple fact. You have at least two lines by which things can be inherited, the mitochondrial and uh, the main uh, germline one. Mitochondria are typically inherited only from the mother. There are some really rare exceptions. But I said mitochondrial DNA as potentially diagnostic and cause. So mtDNA, our abbreviation for mitochondrial DNA. As you get older, your mitochondria end up becoming more and more mutated. In short, we can count the degree of mutations, and we can use that potentially to say what your PD risk is. So this is not something I think people had seen coming before it happened. But you can see if you can just make it out here. This is not a new idea at this point, though. This one goes all the way back to 2006, this um, pivotal Nature Genetics article. But, you know, we're getting more, getting better and better at detecting this. It's becoming sort of more and more something we can do in prime time. But messing with mitochondrial DNA, changes in mitochondrial DNA is potentially another way we can diagnose PD severity, at least. What's this? A bunch of these names are going to come up again. Some of these names have come up already. I'm putting these here because these are all Parkinson's disease risk genes. These are all also mitochondrial genes in one way or another. And many of these are inflammatory genes in one way or another. And many of these affect Lewy bodies also. 
So like I said before, these are all converging pathways that we can test through different means. In particular, I want to point out that GBA is here again, as well as LARC2. These are the two genetic germline mutations I'm about to talk about. Uh, and how do we know how many of these mutations are around there? Because look, one of the tough things about genetics is that although it plays a role, we think, in just about everyone's disease condition, you have to know they have the gene. We don't all walk around with a readout of what our genetic profile is, or at least not yet. So PD Generations has been the Parkinson's Foundation's signature, and I think spectacular effort, effort at figuring out this, how many people with Parkinson's disease have some of these genes. So that's what this is. PD Generations has been a national initiative offering genetic testing for PD genes and the necessary genetic counseling at no cost. If you haven't, if you have Parkinson's, if your loved one has Parkinson's, and you have not been genetically tested, I strongly encourage you to go to the website, get the kit. It's really easy. It's just a saliva swab, and then you put it back in the provided FedEx box, send it back, and get your genetic results. Hopefully, today is making it clear why that is relevant. It tells you something about how your disease might progress, one. And two, I'm going to talk about how it might actually potentially affect treatment. But back to why, what PD gene is, and then I'll return again to why it's important. For what it's worth, it checks for seven of the most common genes. So testing negative with this panel, like any panel, doesn't mean you don't have a genetic component to your disease. It just means you don't have one that we looked for. So here again, GBA and LARC2 are high on the list. Uh, you can do this either in person at one of our COEs, so we do it here at UM. Uh, uh, other COEs are typically doing it as well. Uh, but you can also just do, uh, you can also go online and have them mail you a kit and that will give you the, uh, the same result. It's, we've done a lot, they've done a lot. Uh, of almost 14,000 people now, it might have actually, I think, crossed 14,000 in 2020, I believe it has, um, have been tested. And this has given us great information. About 13% of people have a genetic form of PD, which frankly is more than some people expected. And we expect this number to keep going up as more people are tested, one and two, as we learn to check for more genes. Okay. Now, one of the dangers of online talks, I'm sorry, is that I cannot tell um, if I've put you to sleep yet or not, but I'm going to risk it and talk about these genes some more because I think it's uh, useful information. And also still a matter of diagnosis. Knowing you have this gene doesn't diagnose you with Parkinson's disease. It does diagnose you as someone who's at higher risk for it. Uh, and so I think that's an important distinction to make, but still also an important thing to know about yourself because these are things that potentially we now can do something about. This is the most common cause of familial PD, which is to say if you have a bunch of family members known who have a disorder, LARC2 is the most common kind. It's less than 1% of cases, though, that just pop up. But for familial PD, which is a different situation, this is more common. Uh, I've talked a little bit about what it does. So it's an inflammatory protein to an extent. It detects and responds to stress and it makes sure that cells die that should die and don't die that shouldn't die. So I think that could, I hope that's apparent why that could be important for disease in which neurons aren't sticking around the way they should. Uh, this is a sentence that talks about uh, something that's important to us and perhaps to you also. Uh, specifically, what it does is it helps take out the trash. Lysosomes are ways by which your cells break down proteins they need to break down. And so without them, uh, things don't get broken down, back to our mention of alpha synuclein before. And again, uh, not again, kind of again, in, this is something that is increased in response to an inflammatory event. So again, inflammation as a potential disease mechanism. But this is a diagnostic thing, kind of. You can test this and find out you're gene positive, and that has implications. GBA is the one that you're most commonly going to come up with if you test a person. Uh, a lot of people with genetic Parkinson's are, as far as we can tell, the first people in the family to have the gene, what we call sporadic genetic Parkinson's disease, and GBA is the most common of them. It encodes this long word, something called glucose herbicidase, and uh, again, cell inflammation is the result, and uh, you get increased cytokines, IL-6, I mentioned before, and uh, I don't know, this is interesting to me, but perhaps less to other people. Uh, it also changes your immune uh, activity as well. 
So great. Now I want to turn to another way of thinking of Parkinson's disease as well. So we've gone through a couple, but now we're going to talk about Parkinson's disease as a structural or chemical disease. And this is exciting because this has allowed us to do some uh, things that we simply could not do before. Uh, I guess that's true for each of these paradigms. How you think about this condition really changes how you can uh, examine and treat it. So to return to something we talked about a little bit before, Parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis, yes, but chemically it's a disease primarily of a loss of dopamine. And here, again, you see that demonstrated with the dopaminergic neurons and the lower one being nice and obvious and dark and uh, having largely disappeared in the upper slice uh, of a patient with Parkinson's disease. I mentioned that they're dopamine banks, so there they are in their darkness, releasing what you need and storing the excess. Now, how does this help us in terms of defining Parkinson's disease in a new way? Because those dopaminergic neurons connect with the processing center in the center of your brain called the striatum, and there it is with an arrow pointing to it. So we can use that fact to indirectly look at those neurons, and this is another way to potentially diagnose the disease. Uh, because in Parkinson's disease, those neurons will be decreased, and moreover, they should be decreased on uh, one side more than the other, so asymmetrically. So how can we do that? Well, let me tell you. Uh, we do this through a dopamine transporter or abbreviated DAT uh, scan. And what that involves is getting an injection of a radioactive compound that binds to the dopamine transporter, so where those neurons end in the striatum. Uh, and I mentioned that because that'll be important, the picture I'm going to show you in a moment. But again, this is tagging where the terminals link up to the striatum. And so it indirectly shows you how many dopaminergic neurons you have, uh, because after all, if you don't have the neurons, you don't have the connections and vice versa. That agent, once injected, takes several hours to actually bind to the receptors to fully travel through your body and stick to where it needs to stick. Uh, I say this because I wouldn't want you to think that a DAT scan involves you lying in a scanner for several hours. You get the injection, then you go about your business for a couple hours, and you come back and get your repeat scan. Uh, those scans themselves are about 20 or 30 minutes, so it's about half a day, but the scans themselves are about 30 minutes, but separated by a couple hours. This is the result that we get. Uh, this is what we see. So I mentioned the striatum because that, to some extent, will explain why it is you're seeing what you're seeing over here. The striatum uh, is towards the front center of your brain, and that's what you're seeing over here, the striatal heads lighting up. People with fewer dopaminergic neurons will have less of an area that quote, unquote, lights up. And so here we're comparing a dopaminergic disease to a non-dopaminergic disease. So people with essential tremor also shake, and we could go into the interesting ways and in how that tremor is different, but we won't other than to say that people with essential tremor shake when they're trying to do things primarily, and people with Parkinson's shake primarily when their hands are at rest. And what you're seeing here in the patient with uh, Parkinsonian syndrome, possibly Parkinson's disease, is you get a decrease. Uh, and we talk about the commas of the striatum, as viewed from above, decreasing to periods. Uh, because the posterior portion, the back portion of the striatum loses those connections first. Uh, and so gradually, this long comma turns into a period so one of the supportive things here for Parkinson's disease also said, as I mentioned, there's an asymmetric decrease. You can see there's more of a brightness on one side, the right side, than the left side. So you'd expect this person to be more affected on the opposite side. There's a decrease on the left side, so it's their right side that should be more affected. You'd expect the left to be affected also, just not as much. This is an excellent way of identifying a dopamine uh, affecting Parkinsonism. And I say that instead of Parkinson's disease because, again, what you're looking at is dopaminergic terminals. So you're looking at the ends of these dopamine neurons. Parkinson's disease is far and away the most common cause of the, that decrease, but it's not the only cause. So uh, things like trauma or other Parkinsonian conditions that affect the dopaminergic system will also produce uh, DAT scan changes. That's okay, because what a DAT scan tells you is that there's at least a significant chance that giving dopamine will potentially help the patient because there are nerve terminals there to potentially activate. So it is also important to avoid certain medications. Uh, so in particular, people who are on amphetamine analogs, uh, and a lot of people don't realize that that class includes uh, a lot of ADHD medications. Uh, that, along with a couple of other medications, can also block your dopaminergic terminals uptake of this agent. So it'll look like a Parkinsonian syndrome, and in fact, it's just the medication. So uh, important that you go into these 
tests appropriately prepared and with the right washout period for any relevant medications. And your physician will talk to you about that when they order the scan as well. Okay, that was a lot. So now what? Why does all this matter? Because I hope I have started to make the case that these diagnoses, making these diagnoses with this level of specificity really do help drive personalized care now already, and I think even more so in the future, specifically. If you diagnose a person more accurately, i.e. you subtype them correctly, you say GBA positive, hyposmic, i.e. decreased sense of smell, REM-BD, sleep disorder, positive Parkinson's disease, that tells you a lot of things that are going to potentially say how a person does, as opposed to saying the person has tremors on one side of their body, they have Parkinson's disease. So better understanding the disease. A biomarker-based diagnosis, again, these things that tell us that aren't just clinical, that tell us that we, you're at a high risk of the disease. Some people we said have the disease don't. This happened to me just last week. Um, I did a skin biopsy on a patient that I was pretty sure had Parkinson's disease, but I try to keep in mind that even, I like to think I'm an expert, even in expert hands, you're going to be wrong some percentage of the time. So we thought we'd check, and lo and behold, no synuclein at all, and now we're working him up for a, a unilateral dystonia. He never really showed as much levodopa response, but he wasn't sure if the medication was working or wasn't. It's usually that way. Everyone's journey with Parkinson's is a little bit different. There will always be something that doesn't quite match up, and these biomarkers will help tell us why. And sometimes the why is because it's not even Parkinson's disease, it's just a mimic. And some people we said don't do. I've also had people who looked like they had, were relatively even, had some early changes um, in their gait that I thought really, you know, this isn't Parkinson's disease, this is probably a Parkinson's plus syndrome. We looked at the biomarker skin, things like skin biopsy and so on. It's like, ah, uh, you know, this looks like it's Parkinson's disease after all. This matters because it's important for trials. Treatment trials work on a thing, right? Like they change a component of your body. A treatment trial of an antibiotic will look at whether that mechanism kills bacteria. A treatment trial of Parkinson's will look at whether a particular protein, if you change it, changes the course of the disease. If you put people in the trial that aren't going to respond because they don't have the protein, they look like they have Parkinson's, but they don't by these criteria, it'll look like the trial didn't work. And vice versa. If you have people in there who don't have Parkinson's disease and all its varied manifestations, you may think something works that then when you get out into the quote, but real world, it doesn't. And that's been a problem for animal trial models in particular. So one of the main reasons I think diagnosis is so important. And also, you know, it's not a small thing to identify someone early because if you get someone early, that means maybe you can make a difference. So there are both risk factors, the genes that I mentioned, a whole bunch of different things, maybe an overactive inflammatory response that might mean your disease could be rougher, but they're also protective things also. There are also genes that make things slower. I have patients who've had Parkinson's disease for 20 years. I'm convinced they have PD. They think they have PD. They meet criteria for PD, but they're still playing tennis regularly, and all they have really is uh, you know, a tremor in one hand occasionally when they're not using it. Now, that's not typical, I'm sorry to say, but it happens. And I think it's really important to find out why, because I am convinced there's something about their system or something they're doing, most likely both, that is giving them a better course. And those should be things that once we understand them, that we can use for other people also. I do want to mention, we have trials right now that look at modifying the disease course for people with LARC positive Parkinson's disease and GBA positive Parkinson's disease. So this is my reminder that I feel strongly genetic testing is in a Parkinson's patient's best interest, at least if they're willing to consider disease-modifying trials. Our medications currently are symptomatic. We are not moving the needle on the disease. We are testing ways to. And if you're interested in being part of that effort, uh, well, genetic testing is one of the things that's going to get you there and us there as well. And that's just a shorter way of saying uh, that, you know, these kinds of careful diagnoses are what we need to move to a cure. And I think we are closer to that than we ever have been before in history. And I think we will cure Parkinson's disease subtypes, right? If it's Parkinson's disease is, we will cure certain kinds of Parkinson's disease first. So let's work to identify those. And so that's sort of my call for action. And uh, with that, I'll close and 
thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hawk. I really appreciate the time and effort that you've put into this presentation and guiding us through the journey of diagnosis and what the field is dedicating their time and resources to so we can improve the diagnostics and treatments for our community. A couple questions came in from our community. We received a question from one of our viewers about early detection. Yeah. What would recommend for early detection, especially thinking about um, an adult who has a child? Is this something that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of thing that requires, I think, a careful discussion, because like I said, everyone's Parkinson's is different. Everyone's situation is a little bit different. So you want to be sensitive to those things that might mean that the answer is not quite the same thing in one person as it is in another. But there's some generalities, of course. So uh, first, I think it's valuable to detect something early for the reasons I mentioned. I think there both are now things you can do to slow the disease down, and there will be more in the future. So just knowing that you have Parkinson's at all at least lets you know that it is time to make exercise your second religion, because that will slow the disease course definitively. So that's even without any additional testing. Genetic testing, I think, is useful. It's a, it's a weight on people's mind because some people will say, I don't want to know that I might develop this. Why would I want my kids to know that they might develop this? That's valid, and I don't argue against that. The way I look at it, however, is, is that knowledge is truly power, and that, again, we really can change how we treat you now, at least at many centers, based on what your genetic profile is. So that can't be the case if we don't have a genetic profile, one, two. Yeah, for a lot of these gene, these gene diseases, uh, there's, say, a 50% chance that your child could develop symptoms. But then there again, I mean, knowledge is power. You can choose not to disclose also. And also, look, then you know what gene to test for. And you could test it and find out they don't have the gene at all. And then they're not at any additional risk of Parkinson's at all. So the information can go both ways. So that's what I would say. I appreciate uh, you offering some guidance and navigating this relationship between um, parents and children and, and manifesting Parkinson's disease. I know it's it's a hard journey to go through and to have those conversations yeah. and to address that. So thank you. Uh, one of our viewers today shares that they were diagnosed three years ago, and that diagnosis was based on traditional observational factors. They're curious if they should revisit a diagnosis based on genetic testing, PET scans, what you had uh, offered us. Yeah, um, I don't think there's a reason to revisit the diagnosis unless there's a re reason to revisit the diagnosis. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just trying to frame it. Um, if everything is proceeding sort of as expected, you're responding to levodopa or a dopamine agonist, you're doing well with the disease, uh, no additional features are developing, um, you should go in thinking that you probably don't need to prove you don't have Parkinson's disease, it looks like you do, but that you may want to look to see whether A, there's more information to be gained about what the future might hold, and that would be a reason to try to do a genotype. Um, if you want to be in a trial, that allows people who are already on medication, presumably most people at three years would be on meds, um, that would be a benefit too. And also there's sort of the service to the community. The more people that get tested, especially the people who are doing fine, the more we know about the disease. If only the people who are doing badly get gene tests, we will think genes mean bad things and they don't necessarily. So I would encourage you to get genetically tested with the understanding it probably won't change a whole lot for you at all. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hawk. Would you like to share a little bit more about Yeah, genetic? Descans. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on uh, with structural diagnoses. And in my defense, I think I, I, I like to think I didn't put it on there just because it would be its own whole talk. Uh, but you can detect dopaminergic neuronal act production with something called a DAT scan. So you can do a scan that uh, will show parts of your brain that help produce and transport dopamine light up. And if you have Parkinson's disease, they don't light up as hard. So that's a really good potential diagnostic methodology. It gets to uh, dopamine transport specifically. And so like most diagnostic criteria, there's some cases where it fails to detect Parkinson's disease or detect something and it's not Parkinson's disease, but it's really, really good. It's as accurate or better than clinical diagnosis, and it is good accessory information. So we do DAT scans a good bit. Uh, I put that in the category of sort of structural slash functional 
test because where what's really exciting to me also is sort of automated um, brain analysis, so looking at people's MRIs at their brain structure and trying to figure out if there are certain things, sizes, um, distribution of tracts that help explain Parkinson's symptoms. So those are, are sort of an important diagnostic category as well. Great. Thanks for just mentioning it briefly. I really appreciate that. So we have another a question from Frank, and they are curious, how do you differentiate between Parkinson's disease and essential tremor? Oh, that's a great question. So the clinical criteria should separate most people out like really, really easily, frankly, if applied correctly. People with essential tremor should not have bradykinesia. They just should not have that. So if you have slowness and stiffness, either you need a different explanation. Well, no, you need a different explanation. We have lots of people who have essential tremor. We do because they come to see us. It's not that it happens necessarily more with essential tremor who develop Parkinson's disease as a separate issue. Maybe there's a relation, maybe there isn't. It's equally possible they're just both really common conditions. Um, but yeah, the specifics are no bradykinesia. The other really helpful thing I think is that the central tremor is usually more or less symmetric. So both sides of your body are usually roughly equally involved. But the biggest thing really is the tremor. Essential tremor is an action tremor. Your hands shake while you try to do things, like you know, while you're bringing your fork to your mouth, while you're trying to hold a cup. With Parkinson's disease, it's a rest tremor. So if your hand's just sitting there in your lap, that's when it shakes. Now, holding a cup out in front of you is a rest state after 15 seconds or so. So what we call postural maintenance, holding your hand steady, I mean, that'll shake with Parkinson's or ET, so that's not a way to tell them apart. But while you're doing things, essential tremor, while you're at rest, Parkinson's disease. And Frank, I think is poking a little fun. How how often do we get this diagnosis wrong between essential tremor and Parkinson's? That one shouldn't happen that often. How often does it happen? I don't know. That is a great scientific question I, that I do not know the answer to. Um, I wish I could say, because I, I need to have sort of a, a sense of what's happening out in the community versus what's happening at uh, centers. I know I get a decent number of people who were diagnosed with ET who have Parkinson's disease, but I think that's a sample bias. Those are people who are being sent to me because people are wondering if something extra is going on. Uh, another question. Uh, Parkinson's runs in this viewer's family. My father and brother both have Parkinson's uh -huh. disease. Autopsy of their uncle showed Lewy body proteins. Uh -huh. were are those present in both Parkinson's and Lewy body disease, or was the Parkinson's diagnosis wrong? No, it wasn't wrong at all. Uh, so I think we will, as part of this whole diagnostic, diagnostic shift, I suspect we will be talking about Lewy body syndromes in five years or so. And the disease, the entity Parkinson's disease will just be sort of a historical subset of that. Because everyone who has Lewy bodies in their brain has sort of Parkinson's-like symptoms, whether it's Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's disease. If you remember that slide that I showed back with the brain with these like red spots and dark spots, and I said it starts more where you start to smell and also in the brain stem at the back where your sleep is. So we should say the front of the brain and the back of the brain and it spreads. Lewy body dementia is what happens when it spreads really fast in the front. So the front part of your brain does mostly thinking type things, attention, executive function, things like that. So when it hits that area harder first, it produces a different clinical syndrome, which if it goes on long enough, will typically also develop Parkinson disease features. So no, it's the same condition and people, there's a spectrum in between, sorry, it's the same pathology, but different conditions, different ends of the same pole, and lots of people are kind of in between. If it runs in your family, uh, you know, I think genetic testing is more helpful than not. Thank you for explaining that, Dr. Hawk. We have a speech language pathologist present and they're curious um, about a question of ADHD. Uh, so Letizia is asking, are people with ADHD who have dopamine deficiencies more at risk for developing Parkinson's? I don't know. Um, broadly speaking, probably if you're asking the scientific question, which asks if there's any statistical difference at all, probably. If you're talking about clinically significant, that's my guess, by the way, clinically significant, nah, 
I, I mean, like I bet it's a couple of thousands or hundreds of a percentage point. It's just some percentage of people who have ADHD will have circuitry that will eventually be implicated in PD and people without probably don't. So some subset, but not enough at all that I think ADHD is a risk factor as far as I know. That's why we need to do these genetic studies as we push it further and further back. ADHD is typically a diagnosis that happens much younger than Parkinson's disease. Maybe there is a relationship, but we don't know that yet. That's one. Two, the kind of dopamine dysfunction in the two diseases is vastly different. Again, as far as we know. So two things, two subheadings there. One, Parkinson's is not solely about dopamine. Two, dopamine is a lot of different things at once, different receptor subtypes in different areas, different network connectivity. It's not obvious that even though they share the same term, that there are the same effects. For example, if you give someone ADHD cinnamon, as far as I know, nothing happens at all. Great perspective to have. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Good question. Um, our final question for today's webinar is from our viewer, Ayman. Uh, they're curious if young individuals can develop Parkinson's after having epileptic fits without any family history or early onset Parkinsonism. Are there triggers like this that can, can manifest Parkinson's? The presumption would be that if they had epileptic fits, that it was either coincidence or some uh, unrelated pathology. Because we don't know of Parkinsonian syndromes that I know of off the top of my head that have epilepsy as a strong feature. There are certain genetic illnesses that produce epilepsy and Parkinsonism. Those are not typically considered Parkinson's disease because the circuitry affected and all the other things I went through today are just different processes. Um, but like I said, we want to do better diagnoses so we can discover things. So the correct answer on my part is not as far as I know at this time. Thank you, Dr. Hawk. Are there any final words that you'd <clears throat> excuse me, like to share before we close out our webinar today? Just as this was such a privilege to do and I had a lot of fun, thank you for uh, asking me to do it. Thank you, Dr. Hawk. Always a pleasure to have you present on behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, sharing your time and knowledge with us today. And many big thanks to all of you joining us to learn more about the trajectory of diagnosis and how we can aid in changing um, the pathway of learning what we might be living with. If you had any questions at all, please, uh, and that weren't answered, please call our helpline 1-800-4-PD-INFO. And I want to thank this webinar sponsor, GE Healthcare, for supporting the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. Again, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We have a comprehensive website and many, many more resources that addresses everything related to PD at parkinson.org. You can call our helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO or email us at helpline at parkinson.org. But before you go, as we end the webinar, your Zoom screen will prompt a survey. Our program is fueled by your feedback and we appreciate you taking the time to let us know what you hope to learn about in future sessions. I'll also plug that we are coming up to the end of our fiscal year and I will be sifting through our surveys, starting to develop the programming for our next calendar year. So please know that I take your feedback seriously and apply it uh, for our community as you see fit. So until then, take care and we'll see you at the next Wellness Wednesday webinar. Be well.